With its breathtaking beauty, Antarctica, much greater than Europe, is the driest continent in the world. Its ice cap, however, contains more than 70% of the whole planet's fresh water. This up to three kilometers thick ice sheet makes it the continent with the highest mean altitude. With winds blowing at 300 km per hour and a record temperature of minus 93 degrees centigrade, it is the windiest and the coldest place in the world. Antarctica is really a no man's land, a completely desert planet where man can only survive. But Antarctica is also a ground unexposed to industrial pollution. A world of ice and rock belonging to animal species which have magnificently succeeded in adapting to this environment. However, even for them, the interior of the continent stays beyond reach. The fauna of Antarctica is found on the coastal borders of the Southern Ocean. 300 species of fish live in the icy waters. Hundreds of millions of birds, cetaceans and seals can be watched. No, you are not dreaming. Antarctica is the place where all this happens. But is it the right location for such events? How has it become possible? Everything began long, a long time ago. Today is the 16th of August, 1897. The Belgian Adrien de Gerlache is leaving the port of Antwerp on board of his ship, the Belgica, with two men who will later become famous. The young Norwegian Roald Amundsen as conqueror of the South Pole and the American Frederick Cook for his journeys to both poles. Adrien de Gerlache and his crew were the first men to spend a winter in Antarctica. This expedition was, however, within an inch of a dramatic issue. All the participants being affected by scurvy. One of them died and two became insane. Finally, Frederick Cook saved the rest of the crew by forcing them to eat fresh seal and penguin meat, rich in vitamin C. The conquest of the Poles was the theatre of dreadful dramas, which can be explained by the misunderstanding of the first explorers for the unconceivable climate conditions of the continent. At the beginning of the 20th century, its isolation is complete. The boat journey from Australia or New Zealand takes one to several months. Travelers have to face the terrible southern sea storms with more than 15 meter high waves which damage the vessel structures and wash the men off board. One of the most moving human tragedies in Antarctica relates the merciless race for the South Pole between the English Robert Falcon Scott and the Norwegian Roald Amundsen in 1911. Robert Scott was an English officer who had successfully led an expedition in Antarctica at the beginning of the 20th century. 
To reach the pole this time he chooses the way opened in 1909 by the British explorer Shackleton, who arrived 180 km close to the pole. A 2800 km round trip, including the climbing of the 160 km long Beardmore Glacier. The second competitor, Roald Amundsen, was a Norwegian explorer who had discovered the northwest passage between Canada and the Arctic ice pack on board of his small boat between 1903 and 1906. Amundsen's dream was the conquest of the North Pole. So from 1909 he succeeds in setting up an expedition. But nine months before his departure, after hearing his friend Cook claims to have reached the North Pole, he secretly changes his plans and decides to try the South Pole conquest. Nearly ruined by the preparation of his expedition, he leaves Oslo on board of the Fram. Only in Madeira does he announce his crew the real destination of the expedition. He also sends Scott a laconic telegram about his project. Scott, for his part, arrives in Antarctica with 65 men takes advantage of the summer of 1911 to establish fuel and food depots which will serve during the final attempts to reach the pole. Unfortunately, and against all advice, he settles the biggest storage too close to the base camp. This mistake will later be fatal. After the winter, an unusual caravan of motorized vehicles, dogs and ponies pulling sleds moves towards the pole. Amundsen too is preparing. He is an effective and skilled explorer. He has spent his whole life to learn and improve the polar survival techniques. He bases his expedition on his experience with the Inuits and just like them he chooses to use dog sleds well adapted to polar weather. He chooses his little team and on the 19th October 1911 he leaves with four companions, four sleds and 52 dogs. With the opening of an unknown and highly difficult way he arrives on the polar plateau at an altitude of 3000 meters on the 21st of November, covering 30 km a day and climbing 1700 meters a day during the ascent of the Axelheimer glacier. Amundsen's idea is to kill the weakest dogs on the way to feed the men and the remaining dogs. So he solves the problem of transport and food. But for this sensitive, dog-loving man, it's a nightmare. So he never takes part in the dog slaughters and the first meals of boiled dog flesh are no pleasant uh -huh. treat. Det lukter det, for å ta prøven på dem, Hansen. Hvorfor det smaker like bra? Ja, prøv på han. Du har jagget meg godt. Det er godt. Thanks to this supply of fresh meat in their food, Amundsen and his companions avoid scurvy. and on the 14th of December, they reach the South Pole. To show his gratitude to his companions, he asks them to join him in planting the Norwegian flag. Uten felles innsats av samt, hadde det ikke vært mulig, derfor skal alle være med å plante flagget. 
Så plant vi dig du kära flagg på Sydpolen och ger sletten den ligger på navnet Kong Håkon den syvende. A little tent is erected. Latitude measures are multiplied during 24 hours to make sure they have reached their goal. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 12 grader. 46 grader, 12 minuter. At the same time, Scott is still 572 km from the pole. Indeed, since the very beginning of the expedition, the motorized vehicles have broken down. The ponies must be slaughtered at the foot of the Beardmore Glacier. So the men have to haul their 360 kg heavy sleds on the infernal distance of 2000 km. They reached the pole on the 18th of January 1912. When Scott sees Amundsen reached the pole five weeks earlier, his disappointment is clear in his notes. The worst has happened, and goodbye to most of the daydreams. Great God, this is an awful place. The day after, Scott leaves back to the base camp. Well, we have turned our back now on the goal of our ambition and must face our 800 miles of solid dragging. A long way to go, and by Jove, this is a tremendous labor. In spite of extreme weather conditions, Scott adds 15 kg of rock samples on the overloaded sleds. The already exhausted men are wearing themselves out. The fuel cans in the depots are badly conceived and let run out the fuel necessary to melt snow. Saturday, 27th of January. We are slowly getting more hungry and it would be an advantage to have a little bit more food, especially for lunch. Thursday, February the 1st. Evan's fingers are now very bad and to my surprise, he shows signs of losing heart over it. Our faces are much cut up by all the winds we have had. One month after leaving the pole, the first drama occurs on the 17th of February. After lunch, Evan still not appearing and all four started back on ski. I was first to reach the poor man and shocked at his appearance. He was on his knees, with clothing disarranged and a wild look in his eyes. And when we got him into the tent, quite comatose. He died quietly at 12.30 a.m. After Evan's death, the situation is getting worse from day to day. Oats' feet are frozen. The early winter temperature falls to minus 40 degrees centigrade and the blizzard is blowing continuously. Saturday, March 10th. Oats' feet are worse. Poor Oats said he couldn't go on. He slept through the night hoping not to wake, but he woke in the morning. It was blowing a blizzard. He said, I am just going outside and maybe sometime. We tried to dissuade him. He went out into the blizzard and we have not seen him since. This sad day was Oates' 32nd birthday. After Oates' sacrifice, the last days of the three survivors became a nightmare. Hauling their sled on snow crystallized by the deep cold, the unfortunate men have the impression of pulling their heavy load on sand. On the 29th of February, 
the three men are erecting their tent for the last time. Outside the door of the tent it remains a scene of whirling drift. We shall stick it out to the end, but we are getting weaker, and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. For God's sake, look after our people. Their frozen corpses will be found nine months later, only 18 kilometers away from the one-ton depot which could have saved them. Years after Gaston de Gerlache, Adrian's son, went to Antarctica to build King Bodwin base. From 1957 to 1960, three expeditions were sent there. The scientist Guy van Pelt took part in the third one in 1960. The members of that expedition stayed there for 15 months, enjoying a relative comfort. Nevertheless, their working conditions, although painful, were nothing compared to the first explorer's situation. Non, je pense que un confort, je dirais un confort normal de camping était vraiment là. On avait la chaleur qu'il fallait. Donc quand tu vois en 50 ans ce qu'on est parvenu à faire, et maintenant on va encore plus loin, 1880, Arbouillin, de Gerlache, Amusent, cela, ça c'était des... des... On peut dire que c'était des, des gars impensables. Confronted with the merciless weather, Guy was the powerless witness of a terrible drama on a visit to the Japanese Antarctic base. Il se fait que, comme les Japonais préparaient un raid topographique, Fukushima faisait partie de l'expédition et en fait il travaillait dans un shelter qui était probablement à 50 ou 100 mètres de l'entrée de la base. Le blizzard s'est levé, un blizzard très très sérieux, et le soir, Fukushima n'était pas rentré à la base. On a décidé de faire une ronde encordée au départ de la base pour essayer de retrouver Fukushima, et malheureusement, on n'a rien trouvé. Et je pense que trois ans après, on a retrouvé son corps pratiquement intact à trois kilomètres de la base. This episode shows that if the world had changed in our countries, things out there were almost unchanged since Scott's death. In spite of the permanent evolution of technology, Antarctica remains the most inhospitable place on Earth, where the slightest error can lead to death. Until today, Antarctica has been preserved from all industrial and military activities by the Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1957 and ratified by 49 states or parties. But recently, all sorts of activities such as tourism have appeared, with currently more than 35,000 visitors a year. But is it the right location for such events? However, these activities are strongly regulated by the International Association of Tour Operators in Antarctica. This association sets very strict rules. Obligation to use a non-polluting fuel, 
decontamination of visitors prior to landing, limitation to 100 people on a site at the same time, each 20-person group being accompanied by a specialized guide. Thanks to these measures, the impact of touristic activity can be considered as insignificant, which is not the case for some scientific basis. The real danger threatening the Antarctic continent doesn't come from responsible tourism, but from the break-even point of an eventual industrial ground exploitation, as well as the climatic changes that our planet undergoes and which directly influence Antarctica. This continent is needed for the survival of humanity, for its protection and also by respect for those who have discovered it at the price of their life, let us wish that it will always remain a no man's land. A ground which does not belong to anybody and overall reserved to peaceful and non-industrial purposes. <laughs>